welcome back to another episode of The Prosperous Empath. I am so thrilled to share today's interview with you on the podcast. Today we have Amy Mariani on the podcast. Amy is an attorney and litigator turned mediator. And I actually met her through a networking organization when I moved to Boston late last year. I was looking for local chapters of this networking organization that we're both part of. And when I saw Amy's bio and what she was all about and the values that she stands for, I realized that I wanted to visit her chapter because of her. And uh, she does not disappoint. (laughs) A little more about Amy. For over 20 years, Amy represented individuals and businesses in employment, personal injury, and business disputes. Many of these cases went to trial but Amy resolved many others through effective and creative negotiation. Mm, Fuel for the soul for us ambitious empaths. Her experiences working for regional and national firms exposed her to the unique needs of individuals, small and medium businesses, and multinational corporations. This in turn gives her insights into their similar and disparate interests and concerns during the mediation process. Since 2013, Amy's mediation skills have saved hundreds of individuals and businesses, thousands of dollars, countless hours of time, and immeasurable amounts of stress. Using a comprehensive pre-mediation process, she tailors her strategy in each case to the needs of the parties, maximizing the opportunity for success. Once in mediation, she draws upon her extensive experience as an attorney to help the parties understand what their interests are and how those interests align with the proposals on the table. Her ability to bring parties together calmly and effectively keeps her on the short list of attorneys seeking to resolve six and seven figure cases. There are so many reasons that I particularly enjoy today's conversation. For one, I know through working with so many ambitious empaths over the years that there's some work for us to do in learning how to manage conflict, have difficult conversations with our employees, partners, members on our team, and also learning how to share effective feedback and communication. And something I really took away from myself from this conversation is how being an effective mediator, being an effective communicator, sometimes in conflict-ridden environments and situations, has a lot to do with how you yourself are taking care of yourself and ensuring you're setting yourself up for success. On today's episode, we share a bit more about Amy's story and how she adjusted her career through different seasons of life in order to be more present for her parents, her children, and more. Why she chose mediation at this point in her career rather than litigation and how she sees herself getting to be creative through her work. We discuss how she maintains her own sense of impartiality, especially if she has a personal opinion in the matter. Um, We talked about some nervous system regulation that I thought was really interesting because this crosses over into my line of work and into the lines of works of many of the guests that we've had on our show. She talks about the power of breath work and recentering her thinking and processing to a more rational place um, and how understanding your nervous system can impact the way you listen and respond in hard conversations. There's just so much gold in today's conversation. I look forward to hearing what you take from today's conversation and let's jump in. Hello and welcome to the Prosperous Empath Podcast, designed especially for empaths and highly sensitive entrepreneurs, just like you who are committed to achieving holistic success. I'm your host, Catherine Wood, master certified coach, author, mastermind leader, and founder of Unbounded Potential, a boutique coaching firm for empathic entrepreneurs. I'm on a mission to bring empathy back into the world of business. Each episode will focus on achieving more by doing less through leveraging empath-friendly leadership practices, boundaries, rituals, and systems, all the while continuing to care deeply about ourselves, others, and the world around us. If you are committed to joyful living and running a conscious business, but amassing wealth while doing so, proving that you can have both in a society that tells you you can't, then you are in the right place. Join me here each week to find out how. 
be sure to subscribe and leave a review so you won't miss an episode. Plus, you'll find all the show notes and helpful resources over at unbounded-potential.com. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I am, you know, I'm excited to have you on the show today. I don't know if I got to share with you um, previously that I've worked with a mediator before with a prior business partner. So I'm so excited to kind of ask you all the things that I would have loved to have known when I was in the hot seat. (laughs) All the behind the scenes stuff. (laughs) Totally. Um, Well, I'd love to just start us off by inviting you to share a little bit about your story and how you got to be here. Sure. Um, Well, I'm a lawyer by training and practiced law for a number of years and uh, converted my practice about seven years ago over from litigation, which uh, is full on adversarial, you know, constantly in the trenches, lots of conflict and and permanently thinking about ways to win uh, and switched my career over to mediation in 2016, um, in large part because I was looking for a different lifestyle. Uh, not necessarily immediately, but longer term. So my kids are teenagers right now. One is about to go off to college next year. And I wanted to live life differently uh, once they're in college. I wanted to be able to travel and not be on a trial calendar. And um, mediation has always been something that I really enjoyed as uh, an attorney. It was terrific to see the level of resolution and clarity that it brought to my clients. And I thought it would be really cool to be able to deliver that kind of clarity and closure to other people. So uh, I got trained as a mediator and uh, have been doing that for the past seven years on a full-time basis. I can appreciate um, the desire for a different lifestyle that pulls people into career transitions. Um, I'm curious what your experience has been as a consequence of that change in your work and the and the impact on your lifestyle? It's been a really good transition for me because everyone thinks that when your kids are little, they need you more. Uh, I've actually found that my kids need me just as much as a teenager as when they were little, um, but in a different way. So being present for them when they are uh, in need of me now is just as important as being around for them when they were little and uh, taking care of them and giving them their baths and doing all of that sort of stuff. The emotional presence that I need to have for them now is is tremendous. And um, having the grace and the ability to be there for them because I don't have to worry about filing a brief at 10 o'clock at night or whatever. Uh, You know, if they've had a tough day at school, I can talk to them about the tough day at school and really be there for the conversation and not have 80 zillion things running through my head. The other thing is, you know, my parents are now in their 80s and they're starting to deal with some health issues and, and some other related things. My bandwidth for dealing with my parents is uh, far greater than it would have been if I were still trying cases. So for me, it's really been a terrific move because it's allowed me to balance the personal and the professional a little bit more uh, than I was able to do when I was in court all the time. I think that's such a beautiful reminder. You know, a lot of our, my audience is geared around building a business that supports your desired lifestyle. And you come from a field where, that is very challenging. So I so appreciate the modeling of redefining your career on your own terms. And it also sounds like an alignment with your values. Like it sounds like you really get to employ more of your values and qualities that are core to who you are in the work you're doing now. I'd agree with that. Uh, I, don't get me wrong. I loved being in the courtroom and I love winning. I don't think there's a, a human being out there who doesn't love to win, whether it's a card game or whatever it happens to be. Uh, I think that's in, an innate part of our DNA in many respects. But by the same token, I also like to create. And litigation is not about creating. Litigation is about destroying in many respects. It's about undoing something that... Um, that, that needs to be undone for whatever the reason happens to be. And, and mediation in turn allows me to help people walk away from a difficult situation without necessarily having to destroy everything that, that underlies 
that particular conflict. So that's a really nice thing. Mm. Uh, I I love that idea that you get to create now. Um, Martha Beck talks about this idea that we're I we're either reactors or creators of our life. And I'd love I'd love to hear like in what way do you see yourself creating through your mediation work? The biggest thing is I can help folks see opportunity where they don't think opportunity exists. So one example uh, that that I can share with you is um, I'm currently working with a an academic institution where two sets of people within the institution are not getting along and haven't been for quite some time. Uh, they're, they're very valued by the institution and uh, the institution has made a commitment to try and see both of them succeed. So in a litigation setting, the two of them would be dividing, you know, say the, the assets that the two of them had shared in their work before. It would be very much win or lose. You're getting this, I'm getting this. In the situation that I'm in where I'm, I'm mediating between the two of them, we can start thinking about other possibilities. Uh, we don't have to limit ourselves to what's on a, a singular piece of paper. We can start talking about, well, what do you envision your business looking like in five years or 10 years? How do we get there? What's essential to you that you have now uh, to bring forward to help you in that work? What don't you really need? Uh, and, and we can have a more fulsome and more robust discussion. And that allows them to start thinking about not just what's in front of them, but also what are other paths? How can they get to that same destination that they have in mind for the next five to 10 years without necessarily adhering to the path that they had thought was the only way to get there? So that's a really nice, uh, a nice thing about the work that I'm doing. Mm. I, I'm, I'm going to hear like the idea of being able to see new possibilities outside of your perspective or new ways of thinking or responding or I mean, that sounds very rewarding. It's extremely rewarding. And the other thing that is really helpful is it allows people to, to look at a situation with a measure of peace because they, they get a better understanding not only of their own needs, but of the other side's needs as well. So they may end up still disagreeing and still not liking one another, but they have a better understanding as to why the other person is doing and saying the things that they have done and said. Uh, and that allows them to sort of close the door on a chapter of, of life and move forward with a little bit better sense of peace about it. Mm -hmm. um, so can we talk about impartiality for a moment? <laughs> because, you know, for any of my audience who's worked for our audience who's worked for with a ther couples therapist or um, a business coach for their company, you know, there's typically one party who brings in the consultant or the support professional. And I have experienced personally varying levels of impartiality from those professionals. So how do you, how do you maintain that sense of impartiality? And what do you do if you have a personal opinion in the matter? That those are really great questions. Um, it's human nature to connect with certain people more deeply and more authentically than you do with others. So in order to prevent that from influencing in a negative way, the, the, the um, way I'm driving my process, it's really important for me to be in check with my own biases and in check with my own reactions. So if I feel like we're having a conversation and I all of a sudden have a visceral reaction to something that you're saying, I need to take a step back and I need to ask myself, why am I having that reaction? Once I've triaged why I'm having that reaction, that then allows me to come back into the conversation in a way that's not going to do harm to my ability to stay out of it uh, and stay out of the issues that you and the other party are trying to work through. So that's super important, uh, maintaining a sense of calm and, and an identification of my own self and my own reactions is, you know, that's that's part one. If you cannot do that in the mediation process, you're probably not destined for a long-term career as a mediator. <laughs> you, you just aren't. Um, 
The other thing is acknowledging to folks when I'm, uh, in what kind of relationships I have with both sides so that the air is clear at the beginning of the day. So everyone knows that, you know, I've met you before, but I may not have met the other person. And then taking the time to make sure I establish rapport in a relationship with both sides, figuring out where my connection is to somebody uh, that I haven't met yet is super important because there's a way for me to connect with every other human being on this planet. It may not be the same thing I connect with you about and you know, th that I connect with the other person about. You and I may talk about, uh, you know, a love of nature or a love of being on the ocean. And the other person and I might talk about football. Um, but there's, there's something that I have in common with just about everybody. And once I've figured out what that is and started to develop a relationship where we can connect, that helps me narrow that partiality and create a the ability to relate in different ways with different people. So it's not always going to look the same for each side of the, the relationship, um, but finding that human connection is really integral to the work that I do. So I hear number one, being able to check your biases, check them at the door, <laughs> and two, creating that human connection. But I just want to go back to the first one because I think the ability to check your biases in the moment, especially if they're activated, is a Jedi mind trick of sorts. So <laughs> what does that actually look like in the moment for you? So, yeah, for me, I generally uh, I get this sort of icky feeling and it could be, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm just sitting up differently or my stomach is uncomfortable, or I just feel like every nerve is on fire. And I've learned what my cues are. And those, those are a couple for me, uh, or I feel like I, I have to say something. And if I feel like I have to say something, that's usually an emotional response on my part. It's not, it's, it's not necessarily the right thing to be doing. So, uh, when I recognize those things happening, using breath for me is huge. I just take five good deep breaths and it may seem like something that's so simple, but it works. It, it really helps to calm down the parts of my brain that are acting in a less rational fashion and allows me to recenter my thinking and my processing to the parts of my brain that are more rationally centered. And that makes a huge difference in my ability to respond and reply to people. I love that reminder that when there's this part of us that feels the need to say something that's likely the exact thing not to say. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm even thinking of how this plays up, plays out in our primary relationships, you know, like in my, in my marriage, the part of me that feels the need to correct how my husband is taking care of the dogs or making the bed or doing these simple things, you know, and it's typically that knee-jerk thing that I want to say that's the very thing that I should keep my mouth shut about. <laughs> right. And, and there's a fine line there because if you don't say anything about it for too long of a period of time and it's it's an irritant to you, then it ends up coming out in a, in a negative way down the line. So it's figuring out how, when, and where to have the conversation. Uh, often in the moment, it's not the right time to address whatever the issue is. Uh, too far down the line, and it's gonna create a, a negative emotional response. There will be a trigger to the 10th or 12th time that the dishes aren't put in the dishwasher the right way or whatever. Um, but if you can figure out how to say, hey, at a, at a point in a time where the other party is going to be more responsive to what you're saying and more receptive to what you're saying, and you've had some time to think about how to position and posture what you want to say in a way that's not, um, not critical, not demanding, that makes a huge difference in the ability of the other person to receive the message. 90% of my job is translating between two sides who can't listen to one another because their emotion, emotional responses are heightened to one another. I'm the translator. I'm the person who takes the information from side A that side B simply can't hear because they, they're on reflex response 
and, and I help side B understand what side A is saying and wants. And I do the same for, for each of the sides. So posturing and positioning that conversation in a way where both sides can hear one another is really what matters. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful reminder to, you know, have our eye on when our nervous systems are activated, that that's typically not the moment to say whatever's on our heart or whatever we're feeling <laughs> confronted by. And I'm, I'm also reminded of um, the idea that we typically listen to respond rather than listen to understand. And it sounds like in a lot of your work is about not only listening from that place of understanding, but then ensuring the other party understands. Right, right. And one really simple technique that people can use to listen to understand and to make sure that other people understand them in conversations is reflecting back. So if I were to say something to you, one thing that I might do is, um, you know, either check in with you and say, now, you know, I just want to make sure you understand what I said and, and that your understanding and mine are the same. Do you mind repeating back to me what you think it is that I was communicating? Because I may not have communicated effectively. And if you repeat back to me something that's not what I intended to communicate, we've identified that we are, we're missing a step. And we can go back and we can create that step that's necessary for both of us to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. And even in that example, I really appreciated your use of the framing. I might have not communicated correctly, <laughs> really speaking from that, that place of I and self-ownership versus pointing the finger, speaking about the other party over there, making it their, their fault, their challenge their problem it makes a huge difference when parties in conflict accept responsibility for their portion of the conflict and there could be a debate over who's more at fault until the end of time but if each side is willing to step up and say yeah i did something that made the situation more difficult that goes a tremendous way toward getting the situation resolved Mm -hmm. One thing I appreciate is that many of the people listening to our episode are likely uh, ambitious empaths, which, you know, ambitious empaths are often highly driven, highly perfectionistic, and have very high standards. And I think that when we're driven by those high standards, they can oftentimes result in... Um, poor communication skills, <laughs> thinking that we've, you know, communicated exactly what we want. And then we feel, uh, you know, just wildly, our expectations are, um, you know, wildly shot when, when the, we don't meet those standards. So I really am curious for, you know, for our audience who might be willing, how can they how can they practice? Um, what is it that I want to say? Like when you have high standards, how can you bring those into conversation in a more responsible and um, self kind of eye perspective? I think there are a couple of really easy tips there that, that, well, they sound easy, but they really aren't. Um, the first <laughs> is you have to, you have to be willing to give yourself, uh, the benefit of the doubt. So many of the people that you're talking about have extremely high standards and therefore are incredibly self-critical when, when they don't meet their own standards. So you've got to give yourself the grace to, uh, to, to mess up and to be wrong sometimes. So that's that's step one. Uh, step two is to always look at the situation from the other person's perspective and understand that uh, none of us are perfect. And as a result, our communications aren't perfect. Uh, and if we keep that in mind and we keep in mind the fact that um, mistakes are going to happen in communication, it makes it much, much easier for us to um, to think about how is the other person hearing this? 
Uh, and then that allows us to continue the conversation in a more positive way. Mm. Well, I mean, I think that is a really beautiful segue because, you know, you're a mediator. I'm a coach. We know what we know. We have a, a, a very high EQ scale and it can be really hard to employ what we know in the moments or separate what we know from who we are in our personal lives. So how how do you kind of walk the, that fine line between being a wife, being a mom, being a mediator, an attorney, and a human with needs? Um, it's funny because I actually don't bring the skills that I have as a mediator to my personal life as often as I probably should. So for example, uh, if my kids are driving me batty, instead of diving into why they're reacting the way they're reacting to whatever the stimulus is, the way I would in a mediation, my reaction is just mom. You know, it's just, hey guys, you know, enough. I'm on the phone, you know, quiet down, whatever it happens to be. So I need to be more mindful in my own personal life about, you know, let's, let's, figure out why. Let's figure out what's going on. But then when I do try to do that, my kids sometimes are like, mom, enough. No, I don't want the mediation stuff right now. Just sit and listen. So it is, I have to take my cues from the people around me, I think is the best thing that I can, uh, best way I can describe it. Because um, there's a time and a place for me to bring those skills to the the, the communications I have with my kids and, and my husband. And then there's a time and a place to just, you know, be natural and and not think quite so much about every word and every perception and read too much into things Mm -hmm. because it's easy to do that too. I really appreciate that. I mean, in my early on in my relationship, you know, my knee jerk response was to provide a solution or give my husband advice or, you know, offer my two cents, which is the exact opposite of what I am so naturally practiced in as a coach. So it was just interesting that it was like, I needed that outlet, but what I have come to realize with a lot of practice and and grace, to use your words, is that when I withhold that and just listen and allow him to vent or share whatever he needs to say, eventually he he typically does ask for my two cents, and then he's so much more open and receptive to hearing it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a really interesting phenomenon in almost all of the mediations that I do. Uh, Uh If I've got an, if I have an eight hour mediation, um, usually that breaks down into an hour spent listening and asking a few questions with each side uh, to start things off. So if you were on one side of the mediation, uh, I would probably listen to you for 45 minutes or so with, um, very little interjection on my part, maybe a clarifying question here or there, but for the most part, just listening to you tell your story. And then after that, we'd start talking for the last 15 minutes or so of that session, we'd start talking about what outcomes are you really looking for? What are your, really your interests here? Uh, But the bulk of it is just allowing you to do that emotional dump, getting rid of all of the thoughts, getting rid of the random ideas that are running through your head so that the next few sessions can be more focused and more productive because you will have already done that brain dump uh, and and we can really uh, start diving into what matters as opposed to what's floating around in your brain uh, that that needs to come out, but isn't necessarily going to be productive to the conversation. So it sounds like your husband's doing something very similar with you when he gets home. <laughs> well, I love, I mean, I love that framing. And it just has me curious if the emotional dumping, if it's shared in the presence of both parties, or if those conversations are held separately. Sometimes it's shared. Most of the time in the work that I do, which tends to be pretty high conflict, um, it's not. So I do a lot of employment cases that include sexual harassment and discrimination claims, race discrimination claims, um, handicap and disability discrimination claims, uh, all those kinds of things. 
business relationships that have gone awry, uh, personal injury cases where the emotional or physical toll on one party or the other is is pretty significant. So there's a lot a lot of conflict there, a high level of emotion. Not to say that that's not true in other situations as well, but they're particularly heightened in those in those cases. And as a result, oftentimes it's easier for people to talk to me without the other person being present. So in those circumstances, I do what's known as caucusing and I will meet with each side separately. There are cases where it is very productive to have both sides in the room and have a back and forth. But there we have some very clear ground rules as to who's talking and when. And, um, you know, I basically tell people that if we're in a caucus, set, if we're in a, a joint session, everybody's got a piece of paper, write down what it is that you feel you need to say while the other person is talking. And then when it's your turn to talk, take a look at that piece of paper and figure out, do I really need to say that? Or is that that just my emotional reaction to what they had to say? Is it necessary to the discussion? Because if it isn't, it can stay on that piece of paper and then that piece of paper can be shredded at the end of the meeting. That feels like a useful practice for anyone in conflict, <laughs> regardless of whether they're working with a mediator. I think you're right. I think people, people oftentimes have discussions before they're ready to have them, before they've really thought about what it is that they want out of the situation, what it is that's bothering them about the situation. And as a result, we're going back to, you know, to the, to the brain. Uh, they're, they're talking from the wrong part of the brain. They're not talking from the part of the brain that's going to allow them to resolve the situation with uh, clarity and with focus. I mean, one thing I appreciate about what you're sharing is that it sounds like a lot of your work uh, would pull at your heartstrings. It makes me wonder how you take care of yourself outside of uh, the conference room that allows you to show up so grounded in the moment. There are a couple of things that I do. First, I limit the number of cases I do during a week. So I don't mediate back to back to back to back. I, I simply don't do that because especially in some of the employment and personal injury cases, uh, the level of emotion involved uh, is is very high. You know, some of the some of the injuries that that I see, uh, both physical and psychological, are, are significant. And as a result, yes, I need some time to process that and and let it go before I can move on and really help somebody else. So I typically will not schedule back to back. Uh, the other thing is I make sure that prioritizing certain things in my life like exercise and, and sleep are really high on my list. So making sure that I take care of myself lets me take care of, of other people in my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the simplicity of that boundaries around scheduling, sleep, exercise. I think so often we can kind of forget the basics and the basics make a huge difference. They really do. And I know when I've overscheduled because I get that frazzled feeling. And, you know, it's, we all get it from time to time. But when I'm over, you know, just over my schedule uh, and, and I know I need to cut back, that's when I'm on a, like a Wednesday or a Thursday and it feels like a Friday. And I look to my schedule that week and I go, what did I do to myself? And I then I make sure that I go in and I get really good about blocking out my time in the way that I need to block my time out to work best. Gosh, I feel like you have, you have so much wisdom to share. And I'm wondering, <laughs> so a lot of a lot of the people who listen to the podcast are small business owners, right? Who may be hiring their first full-time employees, have contractors, bringing on partners. I mean, hindsight is always 2020. We don't know what we don't know. But I, I'm curious if you have best practices for, uh, for business owners who might be looking to bring on partners and employees who are likely at some point going to uh, uh, have some conflict that they're going to need to work through. 
Two things I can suggest. The first is making sure you have a really good corporate attorney, someone who is is professionally uh, capable in in a variety of ways, somebody that understands your business uh, and understands your business's needs and can help you grow your business in a way that's compliant with the law. Because when you hire an employee, there are legal responsibilities that come along with that. Uh, And if you fail to adhere to those legal responsibilities, you could end up in a world of hurt. So you want to make sure that as you are growing your business, you are talking to the appropriate legal counsel at all times to make sure you're doing it the right way. The same is true with if you're bringing on a partner. You want to make sure your partnership agreement is drafted in such a you want to have a partnership agreement and b you want to make sure it's drafted in such a way that minimizes um, the risks to both sides as as you move along so those things are really key the other thing is i highly recommend people keep an eye on um, their relationships with coaches and consultants who can advise them through the steps of these processes there are some wonderful folks out there who work with business partners when they start to encounter conflict and can prevent those relationships from going south or can help the parties separate those relationships out uh, in a way that's not going to be damaging to the business that's been created or to the individuals themselves. And and people can literally walk away from a business um, relatively intact, both psychologically and monetarily, in a way that you cannot if you let things build up. So, you know, try to have those relationships established early on in in the the life cycle of your business. They will make a huge difference to your quality of life and to your your long-term success. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of something you said earlier around when we don't say what there is for us to say over time, it can really build up and create uh, in a sense of embitterment that can be hard to come back from. It can, it can. And, you know, so even if you establish a relationship with a, a, a cooperative coach or a business coach um, and you and your partner only meet with them once a year, um, just to have an honest conversation once a year about your business what you're satisfied with, what you're not satisfied with, how you want to grow, how you want to change, um, you know, whether there's been an adequate allocation of resources, both financial and emotional and physical, um, those kinds of conversations held on a regular basis can make the difference between having partners um, grow and thrive in every aspect of their lives Or having one person feel like they've been put upon and all of a sudden the other partner sits there and goes, I thought everything was going great. And and they're blindsided by the fact that their their partner just feels like things are not going smoothly. So it's it's really important to have those check-ins. In my work, I offer a practice to clients who experience conflict in their marriage, whether it's... uh, it's it's a really simple practice. It's the invitation to have a weekly state of the union where they talk about the union of their relationship and how we are doing and what we need. And I think that, you know, when you create those clear lines of communication where you can speak from a non-judgmental, open-hearted, uh, assuming positive regard place that you can so often prevent uh, what you're talking about, like this just idea of um, catching catching our partners, our colleagues, our, our spouses by surprise when we, you know, when we throw out this that we've been feeling for weeks or months or potentially years and just haven't communicated. That's so true. Uh, in most of the business divorce cases that I do, it's because one partner feels like they've been you know, rowing harder than the other partner for a very, very long time. And they just haven't said anything about it. Uh, That tends to be a significant part of the problem in in almost all of the cases that that I handle. So noticing that theme, I'm I'm curious. I, I mean, I understand that this isn't your job in the moment, but I imagine that there's this part of you that would love to offer your your two cents or your best practices. So, you know, perhaps for our audience who's listening that may find themselves in a similar 
place, what, what would you, what, uh, what would you recommend that if, if anything else than what you've already shared? Take care of yourself. You cannot be the best version of yourself without understanding and acknowledging that um, you need time for you. And and I always went at warp speed Uh, for for many, many years. I went at warp speed and did not realize the uh, harmful effects that was having on every aspect of my life. And when I stepped back, and um, just took a little bit of time for myself every day to exercise uh, and, and just just sort of clear my head because that's I don't meditate. I, I lift weights. And when I'm lifting weights, that time between the sets, that's my sort of downtime. Uh, and once I started doing that, I found it brought tremendous clarity and far less stress to to my overall life. So take whatever that happens to be. For me, it's lifting weights. For someone else, it's a walk in the woods. Whatever it happens to be, find that thing that brings you that little bit of clarity every day and uh, make sure that that is a priority in your life because it will allow you to be a better person in every aspect of your life. I love that. I mean, I think that's a beautiful segue to my last question. You know, we're really an audience of of empaths here, and I'm a huge stand for empaths thriving financially in relationships, in how their health and every other area of life. So what what's truly made the difference for you in thriving as an empath? Uh, sleep and exercise. They're, they're two enormous priorities for me. Uh, If I don't sleep well, I can't be at my best. And if I can't be at my best, I can't help others be at their best. I love it. Amy, I feel like I'm going to be coming back to this episode. I took so many gems for myself. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a real joy. My pleasure. It's been a great, uh, great chat today. I love this. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of the Prosperous Empath Podcast with me, Katherine Wood. Make sure you subscribe and leave a review so you don't miss an episode and so more empaths just like you and me can find the show. As a thank you, each month, one lucky reviewer will receive a 60-minute coaching session with a member of our Unbounded Potential team. You can find all the show notes and bonus resources over at unbounded-potential.com. Thank you so much for listening and locking arms with me to bring empathy and prosperity back into the world of business.